In this video, I would like to go over an example that's going to illustrate some of the assumptions that we make when we're trying to solve problems dealing with forces. Um, so the example I want to do is a device called an Atwood machine, um, which makes it sound more complicated than it is. Essentially, what an Atwood machine consists of is a pulley that's attached to the ceiling like this. And we're going to have a string with some mass, M1 on the left. The string then runs over the pulley like this and then comes down the other side to another mass, M2. Okay, and I'm drawing M2 slightly larger so that we have something to work with. We'll assume that M2 is a little bigger. And so um, once we let this thing go, M1 is going to move upward and M2 is going to move downward. Okay, so what we want to do then is assuming we know those masses, we want to find the acceleration. Okay, that's it. That's the problem. All right, so to start, what we want to do is draw some free body diagrams. So I'll start with M1. What um, forces are going to be on M1? Well, we have a gravitational force on one by the Earth. Um, and we're assuming that one is going to accelerate upwards. So I've got a tension force that's a little bit bigger on one by a string. Okay, and then for M2, we're going to have a gravitational force that's a little bigger because the object is bigger. So on two by the Earth. And another tension that's not going to be enough to cancel out the um, force pulling downward. So I'll call that T2 um, by the string. Okay, so we have free body diagrams. Let's write out what we know and see what we can figure out. So using Newton's second law for M1, let's take the positive direction to be upward here to make our lives a little easier. So um, if that's true, then T1S minus G1E equals M1A1. Okay, so mass times acceleration for M1 is equal to its net force. For mass two, I'm going to choose downward to be positive, which may seem like I'm complicating things, but ultimately um, I want the direction of actual motion to be in the positive direction for each of these. That way they will ultimately be consistent. Okay, so then for this one, the positive direction, I have G2E minus the negative direction, T2S equals mass two times acceleration two. Okay, so it seems like there's a lot of stuff we don't know. We don't know the accelerations, we don't know the tensions. If we know the masses, we can figure out those weights. So essentially we have four unknowns and only two equations and we're kind of stuck. Um, we need a little bit more in order to be able to solve this problem. Okay, so I'm going to make a claim. I claim that the acceleration of mass one is going to be equal to the acceleration of mass two. Why should that be the case? Well, let's assume that the string is not stretchy. Okay, so if the string is an ordinary string that is some fixed length, then the position of object two is just going to be whatever the position of object one is plus the length of the string. Okay, so I'm imagining that I have some coordinate system where the um, positive direction kind of goes up and then goes around the pulley and then goes down. So if I know where one of the masses is, I can figure out exactly where the other one is because I know how long the string is. Okay, so then if I take the derivative of this expression, x2 equals x1 plus L, then what I get is, well, the derivative of x2 is going to be v2. The derivative of x1 is going to be v1. The derivative of L is zero because L is constant. It's just the length of the string. So if the string is not changing in length, then this is it. The two speeds have to match. Um, and then if I take another derivative, I get a2 equals a1 and the accelerations match. Okay, so this is a direct result of the fact that I'm assuming that the string is what we call inextensible. This means that the string is just a fixed length. Um, it's not a piece of elastic, it's a normal string. Okay, so that's one claim that we can use to simplify our um, solution to the Atwood machine. Another claim is that the two tensions are the same. So T1S equals T2S if the pulley is negligible. All right, so when would the pulley not be negligible? Well, if the pulley is really heavy, if you have this huge iron disc and like as the masses move, it has to speed up this really heavy thing, then we wouldn't be able to ignore it. Um, if the pulley was really rusty and it had a lot of friction, we wouldn't be able to ignore it. But this is a really common assumption that we make. If we have a high quality pulley that's made out of some light material um, and it moves freely, then the two tensions will be the same. Okay, so this is the assumption that we call a massless pulley. So sometimes um, when you're taking a physics exam, it can feel a little bit like you know, you're reading a legal document. Um, you know, sometimes the, the exam will mention things like massless, frictionless pulleys and inextensible strings. And you might wonder why is all of that in there? Um, and essentially those are making the problem easier. If you wanted to solve a problem where you had a pulley that had friction and it was heavy um, and you had strings that could stretch, um, that would be a really, really difficult problem. And we don't wanna make it that difficult. We wanna make it something that we can solve. Okay, so we now have these two relationships. The accelerations are the same and the tensions are, are the same. And we'll see that now we can actually solve this problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two equations here and here, and I'm going to rewrite them using the same variables since the tensions and the accelerations are equal. So I'm just going to use T for the tension. So T minus um, G1E equals M1A, because um, the two accelerations are the same. And then for the other one, G2E minus T equals M2A. All right, so what I want to do then is um, solve these two equations and two variables. 
Okay, which is something we can do. If we have two equations and two variables, uh, most of the time that's plenty to solve the problem. All right, so there's a couple of different approaches you can do. So one thing you could do is you could say solve for tension, um, plug in your expression for tension into the other one, solve for acceleration, and then plug that answer back in. Um, that'll work, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, I'm going to show you a better way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the two equations together. Again, that's a thing we're allowed to do, because what I'm saying if I have an equal sign is that the thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right. So if I'm doing the same thing to something that's the same, I get the same answer. Okay, so let's do that. On the left, I have tension minus G1E plus G2E minus tension. So I'm getting a tension and a minus tension if I add the two left-hand sides together. That's going to leave me with G2E minus G1E equals. Then on the right-hand side, adding them together is just M1A plus M2A. All right. Well, um, I know that the two weights are just mg, so I'll write those in. m2g minus m1g equals m1a plus m2a. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor both sides. This is just going to simplify my expression a little bit. So m2 minus m1 all times g is equal to m1 plus m2 all times a. So now if I solve for acceleration, I'm going to get a is equal to m2 minus m1 over m1 plus m2 all times g. All right, and that's the answer. If I know the two masses, then I can figure out exactly what the acceleration is going to be, making some simple assumptions about what's going on in the problem. Um, one good thing to do to check that you have um, the correct answer is you can just plug in some simple cases and see if this makes sense. So one thing we can do is we can say, all right, well, what happens if the two masses are the same? Well, if mass one and mass two are the same, then looking at the picture, I expect them not to move because they will be balanced. What happens if I plug that into my equation? Well, m2 minus m1 is zero, and so I'll get an acceleration of zero. So that makes sense. Um, what else can I check? Well, what if one of the masses is zero? So if m1 is zero, for instance, then I expect m2 to just be in free fall. So if m1 is zero, then I get m2 um, on top and I get just m2 on bottom. So the acceleration is equal to g. So that also makes sense. The thing will be in free fall if one of the masses is not present. Okay, so this expression makes sense. We can check it in a couple of ways um, and that gives us the correct answer. Um, whenever you're solving these problems, um, and we will do a couple more in a moment, um, you want to um, keep in mind these two assumptions, that the accelerations will be the same if they're attached by an inextensible string and the tension does not change when a string goes over a pulley. Um, it's going to be the same tension on each side.